So I never liked uh, presentations when someone is just listing uh, pure facts. So instead of this, I'm trying to uh, take you to a journey where we can learn something. We can learn the traps of doing science through the uh, course biography of, of uh, Professor Neer. And basically what I'm going to try to highlight today is to uh, the mistakes a scientist can do when uh, inferring some conclusions from uh, unrelated observations or, or just coinciding events or correlation even um, uh, instead of uh, finding the real causation between, between facts. So since I'm a neuroscientist, this is going to try to shine light on these issues from the neuroscience point of view. And in fact, if uh, someone is just uh, uh, stuck at the different levels of, of, uh, of uh, these mistakes I, I listed before, then the first level is the wannabe scientist or those what we can call as Facebook scientists nowadays. Or if you just step ahead and, and uh, infer from coincidence, then you can still be a bad scientist. But if you put more effort into this, then through being a weak scientist, you can reach a level of being a good scientist. And then some little twist or spice is needed in addition to these uh, to become an Erwin Neer, for example. So let's become a neuroscientist. And, and uh, let's become a neuroscientist in my alternative universe uh, uh, for several minutes. So let's assume that this is how a brain looks like. And if one wants to investigate how, how does the brain work and how does it look like, then what do we do? So what did we do for the first time when we were kids and we wanted to observe something? Of course, we took a, took a uh, magnifying glass, right? So it's probably not a good idea to observe the whole brain because uh, it's, it's you know, probably a life is not enough to find out everything, but we can find some, some little piece of it. So this part is investigated by many people from the social aspect. This part is investigated by many other people from the economics aspect. So let's focus on this top part because it's easy to reach from the top. And if we just pick one, then we will see that there is a very magnificent uh, part of, of uh, this top part. Let's call this gyrus as, as Europe and this tiny part is Germany, and this, this small part that we are looking for uh, as uh, Bavaria or, or Bajorország in Hungarian. So, of course, if uh, we want to further, further investigate what goes on here, then we need some scientific tools or scientific techniques to, to work with. And um, in many cases, what research does, and, and what I emphasize uh, in my talks, is that probably the best spelling of research would be something like this, because we are always focusing on the same basic questions with uh, continuously improving technologies by reapplying the new technologies, but trying to uh, find new answers and new aspects of how, how the brain works and how networks in the brain works. So it's, in general, it's basically a, a good idea to take methodologies and ideas from other research labs. Let's say that in my alternative universe, there is a very famous uh, research group in neuroscience that is called as the Monty Python Group. Uh, they published a um, seminal work actually in 79 called uh, The Life of Brian. And basically their approach was to pose the question that what have the Romans ever done for us to find out the uh, legitimacy of, of the Roman Empire, right? So try to adapt this question to, to our neuroscience question and ask that what has Bavaria ever done for us? So basically it gave rise to many, so this part of the brain gave rise to many very important neurons. For example, Thomas Mann, uh, Röntgen, Max Planck, Alzheimer, Diesel, Ohm, and you name it. But from our point of view today is that in 1944, it gave birth to Erwin Neer. Uh, you can ask that how do we know this? Basically, the first thing a scientist should do is to look into the literature and find factual data that, that everyone else has researched in the past and described. So basically, this is what we call meta-analysis. When we take small snippets of information that exist somewhere else and we try to integrate it into and generate some new knowledge of this. So basically, we can go to the town hall and find the probably it's called civic register or something like this, and find that the, the, birth date, the exact birth date and the birthplace of Erwin Neer, which is Landsberg am Lech, which is uh, at the river banks of the Lech River uh, in Western Bavaria. And if we keep on looking uh, for factual data about this region, then basically we can find that, that this part is pretty important from the Hungarian history as well, because the field of Lech um, 
was the place where the Hungarian forces uh, were defeated for the first time in 1955. This can be found in the Meisterlins Codex, for example. And basically, if we put together these uh, snippets of information and we integrate into something new, then basically we can say that Erwin Ehr is a Hungarian neuroscientist because this part of Bavaria was controlled by Hungarian uh, at some part of the time, right? So probably you can ask him that, but basically the concept is completely false, right? So we need to look into issues much more carefully and we need to uh, perform real data-driven science I mean, experiment-driven science to, to uh, generate new, new knowledge. So the issue that, that drew him to, to become a scientist was probably his curiosity from his childhood. Uh, early on during elementary school and high school, he was very much interested in electronics and bioelectronics and how the electricity in the, in the human body works. So he went to the Technical University in Munich and uh, got a degree in physics. After that, he uh, went to the United States for a short time with a Fulbright Fellowship, if I'm not mistaken. And then he went back to Germany to work at the Max Planck Institute for a while. Um, the problem with, with the research at that time was that there were no specific techniques that had good enough resolution to look into the tiny, small details uh, of the brain. So in our alternative universe, the problem was is that all of the neurons were look like instead of identifying how the different ones uh, were differing from each other. So basically, even more, if we wanted to find out some properties of, of our neurons, then what we could do at that time is that we took a piece of the brain, we measured it, and we tried to extract some components and analyze that, that what is the identity of that extracted component. So the observations that, that uh, researchers could do back that time is that the location, you know, just general observation, is that the location of neurons in Bavaria are something like this. The trafficking molecules in the uh, neurons in Bavaria are something like this. And the source of energy is probably the Bavarian pretzels. So again, if we are trying to make some conclusion on this information that we got from our experiments, is and we infer from these coinciding observations is that it, we will see that probably Erwin Neher drives a BMW, he eats pretzel 24 seven, and probably he lives in Castle Neuschwanstein or something like this. So maybe some parts are true, but some other parts, I'm, you know, I can put a big money on that, that it's probably not working. So again, we need to have some more resolution. And this is when, where partnership can help us, and this is why scientists are working together to find out new technologies to, to investigate the same questions. So he became uh, a partner with a Schwabian uh, scientist, and basically probably the, the uh, Bert Sackmann, of course. Uh, probably this was beyond his expectations, because as I said, that time there were no proper resolution technologies to find out how a good scientist looked like what he was needed. So probably his idea about how a Schwabian or, Bava or a Baden-Württembergish scientist looked like was something like this. So those of you who are too young to get the, uh, get the joke, so this is from the uh, Schwarzwald Clinic, which was a very famous uh, TV soap, like probably 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Okay, so uh, they met and actually started to work together in Göttingen. Um, where, where uh, Erwin Neher became uh, the director of the uh, biophysics department later. And the technical development they achieved, the so-called patch clamp technique, uh, was uh, ahead of the time in the sense that the electrodes they could pull were uh, basically suitable to uh, patch only a tiny part of the cell membrane without breaking the cells. Uh, and they were tiny enough to record the activity only from several ion channels uh, that were behind the, the uh, uh, patched membrane parts. So not getting into the details, because I'm sure that, that his presentation is going to focus on this. The idea is that with this technology, they could get unprecedented resolution, both in space and time, uh, on the the way ion channels are working in the cells and how different pharmacons and uh, neurotransmitters and other substan substances modify the elementary actions of these, these ion channels. So 
basically this was the, the uh, technical background why they were awarded in 1991 with the Nobel Prize for Medicine. And one important notion here is that if you read the uh, reasoning why the, award, why the Nobel Prize was awarded, it is not the in basically not the uh, development of the patch cam technique, but instead the discoveries concerning the function of single ion channels in the cells. So it's, the, it's always the, the scientific value that is achieved by the technology that is awarded uh, later on. So, and this leads us to a very important question whether basic science or applied science or innovation must be preferred and, and uh, pushed towards in a society. And Erwin Neer himself said once that we have to repeat over and over again that innovation comes from knowledge and breakthrough innovations comes from new knowledge which can be generated by, by basic science. So if I try to turn it into a funny way that this is probably what, what a researcher is uh, posed to every now and then, and when one is facing a situation like this, then we have to be very careful to um, make steps not to be off track. Okay, so. This was my first slide, basically, so uh, tricks that you have to uh, employ to get through these traps to use your brain, be smart, always try to, try, try to consider your result in a skeptic way, work hard, be innovative, and I think the little twist that, that uh, is needed to uh, emerge you from the pool of good scientists is to use your, use your luck and be brave enough to take the opportunities that, that are facing you. And you can still ask me that where is the comparison of, of correlative and causative conclusions. I think this is what, what uh, we will learn from, from uh, Erwin Neer's presentation. So please welcome him uh, and please hold your talk. <laughs>